the flash bots PM, the ME MEV roast. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Not sure who's sharing actually, but cool. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the 10th edition of MEV roast. I'm Tina, one of the flash bot stewards. Today, my co-host, Roast Master, aka Meme Master, Tom Smith, will be joining us through his meme and his Rose questions because he's super jet lagged, having just arrived in Taiwan and it's already past midnight there. And also shout out to our new friends and researchers joining from Asia at this hour from the MEV Roast. It's past midnight. Um, I recognize some of you there. So um, as a tradition, um, all questions are good questions and every one of you who choose to do your own research can be our Rose Master. In our pirate ship treasure map roads tradition, we used to prepare rotten fruits and plenty of rum in case we don't like the treasure maps presented. So I hope you have your cups of coffee and your critical minds ready on the lookout for our ecosystem. So in the MEV roads today, we will have three parts. First, a succinct update on flashbots followed by a mini roast QA session led by Palkio. Second, um, Yaren from B Protocol will discuss insights from designing and implementing a decentralized backstop, backstop liquidity protocol and um, will be followed by QA. And finally, Rose questions from the meme master Tom Smith. And if we have time, I would like to hear from those uh, at the end who choose to stay till the end, intro yourself and why you're here. So um, as a start, um, flash spots update. Uh, from an organizational perspective, um, we are still going through the MVP phase of uh, flash bots. And you may have um, seen or read from our um, blog posts that flash bots is a, um, uh, came from a research collective and the research and uh, development uh, are the tightly coupled dual engines that propels us in a phased approach. And so um, uh, we started out really in July and the first Flashbots original spec, which actually has full privacy, but we decided to um, iterate, uh, simplify it um, for the sake of iteration and to test out uh, the validity of some of our assumptions. So essentially what you see now, what you see today, um, we have released um, in November, our proof of concept, which is MEV Geth. And last week in January, our engineering team has released the Flashbots Alpha, which consists of uh, MEV Geth and MEV Relay. And in the next few months, uh, we will first uh, release our ecosystem product, MEV Explore. And then hopefully we will be able to um, present a more decentralized and promotionless version, which is Flashbots Beta, and invite all of the searchers here to Flashbots Olympics. On the research side, August was our first treasure map roast, and this is the 10th. So a lot has been discussed and a lot has transpired and has been thrown away temporarily for the sake of um, iteration. And where we are right now is um, before the new years, at the end of 2020, um, we have received five FRPs in our research repo. Our research process follows that of a EIP process. And our um, first group of MV sub fellows were selected. We expect um, the paper three specified on the Flashbots research roadmap, which is also in the Flashbots research repo, to be published soon. And this will be published by Phil, um, who's on this call, um, with his Cornell re um, collaborators. And um, the second um, FRP submission deadline will be on Valentine's Day. 
So we will select our second sets of MEV fellows um, in February. And lastly, we hope by the end of Q1, we would like to have research paper one and two drafted. Once again, all of the, uh, all of the um, uh, roadmap and deliverables are specified in our uh, Flashbots GitHub repo. So feel free to check it out. All right, next. Um, Steph, do you want to give a quick update on Flashbots Alpha, which we released? For sure. Um, let me know if you hear me okay. So the um, Flashbots Alpha, super exciting stuff. Um, things have been moving quite quickly, and, and it's, it's nice to be able to uh, put this uh, architecture out in the wild and, and try to figure out what, what impact it has um, in, a, in an empirical way. Um, so where we're at right now is we've done some initial testing around the MEV guess with, uh, with some, some miners. Um, and we noticed that there was some, uh, some significant concerns around um, DOS that, and, and spam that we wanted to, uh, to make sure we address properly. Uh, yet at the same time, we felt that uh, there was a need for opening it up for uh, a broader uh, range of uh, participants and users to, to, to start sending bundles. Um, and so the intermediate solution that we came up with is this idea of uh, Flashbots Alpha, where uh, we are uh, providing uh, an endpoint through a, through a relay uh, that allows for searchers to submit bundles uh, to the miners that are participating in, in, in this version. Um, the, the relay itself is in charge of doing things uh, like uh, rate limiting and, and spam protection and, uh, and is then relaying over the, the bundle request to the miners. Uh, so really the goal here is to start to bootstrap the, the adoption um, of Flashbots, both for um, uh, miners and searchers, uh, start to get some feedback um, and, and pave the, pave the, uh, the road towards uh, future iterations of the, of the system. Uh, so right now we're uh, running with about 3 to 10% uh, of Ethereum hash rate at, at any given time on the system. Um, and, uh, and Scott will go a bit in detail about uh, what the searcher experience is like right now and, and the types of bundles that we're seeing. Um, so going forward, uh, this is you know very much so the, the beginning of the development of, of this system. Um, some immediate goals that we're, we're focusing on solving is adding uh, minor privacy so that um, you can have more confidence in the way that the bundles are being submitted, that there's no way to, um, to, to steal them or, or, um, or manipulate an auction uh, with that information. Um, and then the second one is to improve the scalability of the system so that these issues like, like spam and DOS uh, become less of a concern. Cool. Well, next we'll have a sneak preview of MEV Explorer. Alex? Yes. Hey guys. Can everyone hear me? Or can you hear me, Tina? Very Take well. Take that as everyone. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, so MEV Explore is a, uh, an initiative we mentioned in our initial blog posts, uh, the ETH search blog post and the medium blog post, and is essentially uh, you know a public dashboard that we want to uh, share with the community and maintain with MEV uh, related metrics. Um, so it, we're going to present it soon in the in the coming weeks. But until then, and relevant to this to this uh, roast was uh, two particular uh, metrics we've been looking at. Um, so what you're seeing here in that first one revenue split by extraction strategy is uh, looking at the total value that we've quantified uh, that has been extracted on chain since the 11th of February, 2020, related to a transaction ordering. Um, and so it, it is this, this extractable value that we keep on mentioning. So the 124 number is $124 million. Uh, um, and you can see that, so this is, this is quite, quite naive uh, right now, and there's, there's more work to be done, which is why you have this, this big disclaimer, but you can see that most of the value has been extracted through arbitrage. Um, about like 94% in this in this pie chart, and um, the rest is is liquidations. Uh, this is particularly interesting 
the 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 split being quite naive is just liquidation and arbitrage for now. So when you see arbitrage plus trade, that is still uh, arbitrage for the moment. Um, but it's still relatively interesting to see most of the value, at least that we've quantified so far, related to transaction ordering, um, has been extracted uh, in in you know price price arbitrage and these these type of arb trades. Um, one thing that we think is particularly interesting is is the the size of that number, right? One hundred twenty four million dollars is, is is huge, especially given that this just goes back to the eleventh February. If you can go to the next slide, um, thank you. So diving, or I guess giving some more color into this this uh, number, 124 million, the split we see above. This is a split by protocol. Um, the way the split is done is, is you know, because uh, Joey, 124 million since the 11th of February, 2020. So, you know, last year now. Um, nice. Um, so this is a, a split by protocol. So because most ARBs and, and you know, liquidations touch several protocols, they're, they're not double counted, but the, the value is, is split between each of them equally. So again, there's some nuance to this metric, but it's still interesting to see uh, how it splits. So as you can see, it's mostly a lot of the value is, is split between uh, different, uh, you know, automated uh, constant function market makers and automated market makers, which makes sense given that most of the value is, is, is in ARB as we've currently classified it. Um, but it is particularly interesting and relevant to us, even though the metrics are not fully, uh, you know, um, at maturity yet. And we, we, we expect for them to be at that stage soon. And we're very excited to share them with the community and provide more, more uh, transparency into what's happening there. Um, what's, what's, I guess, interesting to us is it, it kind of guides where we think people should be building, um, you know, they're, they're bots and bots that could potentially run, run, run on flash bots. Right. Um, so that's, that's definitely interesting to us in that sense. Um, and that's it. So for MEV Explorer, definitely stay, stay tuned. AVMF is mostly around flash loans. Uh, yes. Flash loans and, um, yeah, mostly around flash loans. Um, I think I think I think liquidations is another place that Ave gets a lot of like MEV. There, you go. thank you, Scott. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the 124 is USD, so we quantify uh, a lot of this in the relevant token it's be traded on. Then we convert that into ETH, and then we convert ETH uh, into USD using using price data. Um, so again, there's some nuance there and how it's converted, of course, but you can relatively uh, trust that figure. Um, so anyway, I, I, I won't dwell much longer on MEV Explore. We're very excited to share uh, February 11th, sorry, uh, Tessa, February 11th, 2020 to uh, early December of this year. Um, so it, it doesn't fully include, I believe, the, the, latest, the latest blocks. This is this is part of the disclaimer of the numbers being early estimates. Um, anyway, uh, we're very excited to share more about Explore soon. Uh, we're kind of nearing the, the the final stages of of iteration of the dashboard, and uh, once we share it with you guys to to see how you use it and uh, what kind of other information you might you might be looking for and how we can you know add more metrics that will benefit the 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 whole community um i'll pass it on to scott for an engineering update on mev search awesome thank you uh so mev search this is the category where we uh we're looking to bring on people who are running bots so a, a searcher is what we consider a bot that is using the uh the flash bots transaction submission endpoint. Uh, and in uh, to, to power that, we've we've created a process to onboard uh, what we call MEV searchers. This is a, a form that they can fill out. It's really, really high level that will eventually uh, allow them to receive an API key that they can use in their bundle submission process. Since 
uh, an API key is currently required to, uh, to to communicate with this because of the the, the denial of service stuff that um, that we were talking about earlier. We open sourced a, a repository here. It's called Simple Arbitrage. It's a, a very very um, small example of how you can use the uh, the Flashbots bundle submission endpoint to submit bundles and how you can uh, you know discover opportunities outside of the Flashbot system. One of the things that we noticed when we started getting some inbound requests for how to use the system was that there was some confusion about what role Flashbots played. They were, they were asking, how do I use Flashbots to find MEV opportunities? And uh, I think we need to do a better job of, of creating more examples and, and more documentation and showing that this isn't the method that you use to discover MEV. This is how you uh, take advantage of MEV in the most optimal way. We've been doing a lot of uh, hands-on with, uh, with searchers right now. We're really trying to get searcher volume up. Uh, we have just a, a few searchers running right now. And the more we get, the more profitable bundles we're going to find per block. And we're really going to kickstart that, you know, the flywheel of more bundle profitability leading to more miners, leading to more uh, searchers that want to participate in the system. So it's really important that we uh, get the volume as soon as possible. Um, yeah, and so we're just trying to expand the the, the quantity of searchers and, and how much we make per per block. Uh, but I have a, a demo that I was going to show you that I thought was kind of cool. We were able to use the system for a, a white hat rescue of NFTs, and uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a bit, so I'll, I'll be I'll be taking over. But the the gist of this demo is that several days ago, somebody lost their private key to a hacker. And the hacker quickly took all of their ERC-20s that were obviously valuable, you know, their, their dies. They took all their ETH, of course. They took a lot of these, these assets. But this user actually had a, a really, really large collection of, any, of NFTs. They, you know, CryptoKitties and Axies and, like, tons of these, these Gods Unchained cards. And we were talking to them and found out that we can actually use this MEV system to rescue NFTs in a way that would not be possible without flashbots. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, so my, my screen shared. Should look good. Okay, yep. so, so, so what we have here is a, uh, is a searcher, right? This is the same kind of a component that you would use if you found some profitable opportunity out in the wild and you wanted to bring that opportunity to the chain not by using a pending transaction, but by submitting it to the Flashbots bundle submission endpoint. And this, uh, th this searcher, instead of going out and finding some new arbitrage opportunity, kind of creates its own profit to the miner if the miner is willing to include several transactions from accounts that don't have any gas associated with them. They don't have any ETH on the account. The problem that we have right now is since the that account has a disclosed private key, any ETH that goes into that account just gets siphoned out. You know, if you if you submit, you know, half an ETH to pay for the gas to conduct these transactions, the first thing that's going to happen is a bot's going to come sweep all that ETH out. So what we did is we created a um, we, we created a set of zero gas transactions, which is a bunch of transactions from this uh, uh, this this account that has been hacked, and then we also created what we are considering donor transactions, which is this is the account that's actually going to pay for the gas, and by including them into a bundle. You can see here we have a bundle where we basically take all these zero gas transactions and then the transaction that actually pays the miner, we throw them into a bundle and we, we ship it up here. Let me, let me go ahead and run this thing actually because the way that this outputs it is a little bit easier to understand. Yeah, so it's actually trying to submit this bundle right now. But the gist of it is, you know, this is the hacked account. Uh, this is Axie. We're saying like the, the, the zero gas transaction is from the hacked account to Axie to move one of those assets to a new owner. And then the other transaction that's a part of the bundle is a check. This is the account that actually has ETH. 
that is communicating with the contract that checks to see that the previous transaction occurred, and if it has, will directly transfer the miner some fixed value. And uh, the, the system will actually will, will trace these transactions working. It will figure out how much gas they use combined. Uh, you can see what the effective gas price is for that bundle to be included, since the, the miner is not going to get paid anything based on transaction fees, but will get paid this, and it will end up uh, uh, and it will end up kind of calculating the gas price just by dividing gas used by gas price. Um, for how the, the key was was disclosed, I don't know actually. I should we should I'll, I'll ask the user how that happened. It, it's something that we've been seeing just all, you know, quite a lot lately, with, especially with like uh, you know, MetaMasks or uh, you, know, you know people that are uh, the Ledger one is the one that I've seen several uh, private keys get get yanked when they you know fall for some sort of a a, a phishing you know hey you know we need to confirm your your twenty four Word seed. Um, so let me quickly show you uh, uh, let, what, what it looks like on chain. Because I mean, I know we're just kind of like looking at some code here that's we don't have enough time to really go into details on. Um, one thing that might be kind of interesting is I, uh, it, it's generalized so that you can make one of these per protocol. So all you got to do to go from CryptoKitties to Axie is, is just you know use a different engine. And this engine basically just constructs the transaction requests for the, the zero gas price transactions. And it could do a bunch of them in a single bundle and then a singular donor transaction that can check multiple things. But let me, uh, I'm gonna show the browser real quick. Cause it looks pretty, um, looks pretty simple when it lands on chain. Okay. All right, am I sharing a screen that's moving? Not the one? Okay. Yep. Good, awesome. Okay, so this is the account that got their private key compromised. And uh, you can see that there's a whole bunch of value that moved out of the system. This is back here around when they got their, their, their key disclosed. And then in the last day, there's a whole bunch of interactions with CryptoKitties where the transaction fee is like exactly zero. If you click on one of these, you know, it's not it's not rounding down to zero. The gas price was literally nothing. Um, but what you can do is see the way the system works is we're gonna look at the block. We're gonna look at all the transactions in the block. We're gonna go to the last page. And you can see that because it was a flashbot bundle, it was included at the head of the block here. And there is a transaction here that doesn't seem to be related, but it is. So this is the donor transaction that basically paid for the rest of these. So we're going to click on here. Um, it's actually a source verified contract, so we can do this. So what we can see is I called on this source verified contract that's open to anybody to use. Uh, a bunch of targets. These are all crypto kitties. The question is, what is the owner of the four kitties that I traded in that, or they tried to move to the rescue transaction in that block? And then what are the results that I expect to match for those? If this gets called and all of these conditions are met, it's gonna take all of its value and ship it to the block.coinbase. Effectively confirming that those things actually occurred and then rewarding the miner directly based on it. Um, yeah, and so this is a, source verified transaction that anybody can anybody can use. And the idea is you just submit value and a bunch of conditions you want to check. And if they match, you you pay the miner. So it's, it's a pretty, it's a really simple, um, really simple contract, but it allows us to basically have one account pay for another account's gas because moving ETH into that account would immediately be swept by a bot. And so we don't need to do that now. We can just interact with things so long as we know the private key. All right, and that's um, that's it for the demo. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm torn on on open sourcing it. I guess I probably should because I think it's a it's a really interesting example because it is a example of using the bundle submission endpoint of the um, of the system. You know, the simple arbitrage only does a single uh, transaction since arbs happen in a single transaction. But this is one where um, 
you know, we're actually using a bundle, right? All these were bundled together and it was important that they all landed in the same block. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I think we're going into um, a QA session. Um, one moment, I'm just trying to, uh, on flashbots and I'm once again trying to share screen. Alex, can you, Alex, can you um, help uh, with curating the questions in the uh, chat, on the side chat? Yeah, that sounds good. We have one from Luke and one from Joseph, I believe, right now. Yeah. Um, so um, I think uh, Luke's question on uh, what, what we plan to do um, to uh, miners who behave in certain ways that are uh, detrimental to the system and adversarial to the searchers. Um, during uh, alpha phase, right now, we have this soft rule of essentially um, uh, we will give them warnings and potentially excluding them from the system. Right now, we're not uh, codifying any of the, these rules yet. We're trying to see where how um, the ecosystem players behave at the moment. Um, so that's uh, where we're doing uh, what we're doing in the alpha phase. And um, Alex, if you can read uh, Joseph's uh, or Joey's question. I, just, I can't really see the screen. Sure. I guess you just you just answered Luke's question, um, or gave part of an answer. Um, Joseph's question is around asking the main saving. So is the main saving the block space from from transaction arts that would have errored or failed normally? I guess the main saving from using flashbacks. <clears throat> Can I answer that one? Go ahead. Please. Uh, I, I think that is is definitely one of them. Is you know that we don't need error transactions to land on chain anymore. Uh, I think another larger one is that um, there's a lot of arbitrage opportunities that are using back running, where you try to slide in a a transaction behind another one, and that can yield to just you know hundreds and hundreds of transactions for a single opportunity. And using the Flashbot system and the way that bundles work, you can actually discover a transaction in the pending queue and include it as part of your bundle. And just uh, you know, instead of hoping that you land behind it, like programmatically, just say like, "I want to land behind this," and you really raise that transaction up to the top and land right behind it. And you're not just spewing garbage into the chain just to capture an opportunity. Cool. Um so, mini rose session. Palkio, are you on the line? Yep. Oh, actually, uh, another quick question on the on, F on the NFT, if we have time. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, two questions actually. First off, uh, is this uh, uh, since since you're sell sending bundles to the Flashbots APIs and they're private? Uh, would a simpler solution have worked where you send, let's say, like one Ether to that compromised address, you withdraw all the NFTs, and then you send that somewhere else? And since the whole bundle is private, uh, the bot would not have been able to steal it. And so that, that's part one. But then part two, it's, it sounds like your framework is, uh, is very cool for uh, making meta transactions work. So like, even if it was not necessary in this case, Sounds like with very little twiddling, you'd be able to make pretty much any account uh, be able to do transactions without Ethereum. Yeah, those yeah, those are two um, really good questions. The yeah, so the question one was, well, if you can just use a private relay, couldn't you just you know submit ETH, do some stuff, and then transfer the ETH out? Um, the problem is is that all the transaction relays out there that are private, you can't gossip a transaction from an account that doesn't have any ether and so you first need to send the ether and then the ether needs to land like the ether actually needs to be your transfer inbound needs to show up in a block before you can actually give it any transactions to um, to send those entities out and by the time that it lands in a block it gets discovered and swept out there's there's bots that are sitting there doing this like you know all day like next block and they pay you know 99 percent of the ether value to the miners to transfer that value out 
Um, I, I think Ivan's question was like, why can't instead of going through the contract, we just send ETH directly in that same block first, and then uh, yeah. yeah, importantly, importantly, do that privately so that uh, if the MEV gas is simulating this, it's first simulating receiving ether, second it's simulating a private transaction. Uh, yeah, so I think two things. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think I'm maybe not understanding the scenario. Are you talking about running a forked version of Geth that allows that? Because the current version of of any private private transaction relay wouldn't allow that to land in the same block. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't MEV Geth allow this? So uh, you you use the MEV Geth send bundle API. The first transaction is a signed transaction that uh, sends one ether from your account to the compromised mm -hmm. account. The yes. second transaction is a pre-signed, pre uh, like taking out NFTs. There's maybe some twiddling with MetaMask to do, given that you don't have gas, but you still need to sign this. But this seems very doable. Totally. Uh, oh, and then, I, and then, like, yeah, my, using using gas. So yes, totally. That is 100% like another totally viable way to do it is to uh, yeah, actually fund the account, actually spend real transaction fees, and then um, you know, return whatever isn't used. Or just make sure that you only put in enough that is that you need to to do the the thing. Yeah, that's that's a that's another totally great way to do it. Probably a little bit cheaper. Yeah, I, I would say that the two trade offs there are like in the current version where miners can technically uh, you know misbehave on flashbots, and we have only like after the fact remediation. It's still if you do it that way, it's still technically possible for them to say like, okay, we're only going to include this funding transaction since the key is compromised. I don't know what the benefit would be because they're getting paid anyway. So like maybe they can also steal the NFTs that way. I don't know. Um, I, I guess the second case that it's relevant would be if you want to have some sort of reorg protection. So like if a Flashbots block later gets orphaned, uh, if you had like an unconditional ETH send as part of the bundle, there's no guarantee that it would get reorged into the same bundle because at that point it might actually just be in the mempool. So I think those are the two right. edge cases, but but largely, yeah, you probably could have accomplished the same uh, effect. Makes sense. And not, not to nitpick too much, the second question is much more interesting. How much have you thought about potentially doing this like meta transactions as a service where accounts with no ether can basically send stuff through flash bots? Yep. Uh, to yeah, that, that is definitely one of the ones that, that we've talked about. It was actually, um, I think uh, it was Vit Vitalik. We, we talked to him about this and that was like one of his first thoughts. It's like, oh, well, yeah, now, now we have like, uh, you know, basically a a globally supported GSN with no like on chain overhead. Um, you know, but but for for any of these systems, you know, t tornado even. I was talking to to Roman about that, and that was like the first thing that that he thought was interesting. It was like, oh well, you know, this is this is uh, you know relays, but the relays don't have any. There's there's no act. There is no middleman, and there's no chance of loss for uh, for the middleman to actually need to charge a um, a premium on. Cool. All right, let's let's move to Val Valkyrie. Sorry, we, we had to cut you off before. Yeah. So, um, so uh, the reason why um, you're seeing this current screen, if you guys can see, was that I think yesterday um, I just keep on getting um, you know uh, waken up by uh, the ETH, uh, security Telegram chat. I I thought there was some hack mega hack going on, but then I realized uh, Palkio was discussing flashbots. Um, in the community. And I um, wanted to protect the uh, anonymity of some of the folks who spoke. So I quoted some of the lines that I found to be interesting. The entire discussion was absolutely fascinating. It reminded me of the early days of the MEV roast, uh, where we uh, are very critical of what we're trying to um, achieve here. And so, um, Pelkio, um, would you like to um, share your uh, kind of major concerns. Um, I yep. think uh, some of uh, the questions that we decided to uh, narrow in on, but uh, we could uh, you, you could go over some of your um, main concerns first. Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Maybe I can just like sum up um, my thinking. So first, let me say that I really like like it's what Flashbot does is really exciting. But uh, in terms of uh, focusing on MEV get, I have a more of a like critical thinking. Uh, on my like controversial point of view is does it do more harm than good? Um, 
So basically, I, I think we all agree that uh, Uniswap, for example, I think it's a good uh, use case, uh, has some like fundamental design flaws. Um, and I think we all agree that in the short term, if MEV get um, takes off, it will enable uh, sandwiching and it will hurt end users. Um, but the thinking is that it's a, like a, it's a necessary uh, pain in the short term to actually fix properly these problems, right? So, <clears throat> uh, but to me, first there is um, I think it would be nice to have a, like a broader discussion about the ethical aspect of this short term pains. And then maybe, uh, you know, uh, measuring the MEV that could be ex extracted through sandwiching on Uniswap, uh, because sandwiching on Uniswap will be uh, made like possible in 100% of the cases where it's possible. So I think it will change a lot um, compared to the situation right now. Um, so that's like the short term uh, thing. But in the medium term, I think it's even more important that either like Uniswap V2 will die because user will just uh, you know abandon it because uh, of these fundamental flaws, and that may be like the happy path. Um, but I think there is another alternate scenario, which is <clears throat> that the user are very like unhappy about being systematically sandwiched, um, so they kind of pressure the DApps. On these DApps, end up uh, having like uh, making partnerships with miners to send their transactions privately, so they will never be seen, uh, you know, in the public mempool, and they cannot get sandwiched because it's all private. And I feel like like this will be like a second order consequence of uh, MEV get, which will be to you know to like push like it, basically that. MEVGeth is about making stuff transparent and enabling more possibilities, but it would actually, as this second order effect, push everything uh, to be opaque again. And it will not actually solve these problems. It will just make everything more like one level more complex uh, without any benefit. That's kind of my fear. So I, I don't know what you're thinking on that. Cool. So um, essentially, there are two questions here, right? Um, which one should we address here? Also, like I think uh, the in fact there are three, but um, I put two here, um, and then there's a third one which you uh, mentioned last, the user harm. Um, the reason why I uh, left it out of the current slide of the QA was because um, that is actually one of the research roadmap uh, flashbots um, major research question. So like uh, in the second research paper for MVP phase, um, you could see on our uh, uh, MVP research repo, um, uh, there is a study of the consensus harm and the, uh, and the study of uh, user harm. Um, and so in this approach. So I think um, that deserves a deeper conversation. I would love to, uh, well, uh, welcome everyone to chime in, but I will uh, direct that particular question to a separate research workshop, which we host um, on a, a semi-monthly basis as well. Uh, so we can go uh, more in depth uh, with potentially deliverables um, to accomplish. So um, yeah, so he, uh, so perhaps, uh, Palkia, do you want to focus on kind of these two questions first? Yeah. Yeah, I think the second is the most relevant. Yeah, as, as a second order effect, yeah. Um, does it actually make everything uh, opaque again? That's my question. Any takers? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I think it's a it's a good question. Um, I think that was one of the things that I originally scared me about MEV, and uh, that I was originally, you know, uh, several years ago in DevCon warning people could be an outcome, and I still think. It is a very realistic scenario. Um, I think, like naturally, these kinds of on-chain decentralized financial products are going to create some asymmetries, um, and I hope that one of the things that's going to be different about the Flashbots org from other uh, extraction channels, private mempools, uh, etc., is that is like a commitment to reducing those asymmetries um, as much as possible through open source. Uh, so I think. Uh, 
uh, yeah, maybe Alex and other people can talk about how we see that. But yeah, I share that concern, even with my own, um, even like decisions as granular as like participating on this call, you know, I think we all share that fear. Um, and, and from my reasoning, it's going to matter a lot how MEV is handled in the next two years uh, of the ecosystem. And uh, as much as I wish I could say, like the outcome will definitely be more transparency, that's not necessarily the case. So I think we have a lot of work to do to actively be committed to actually making that happen. Uh, and there'll be like nebulous scenarios where we have to prove that through actions. Yeah, uh, just one th more thing. My point is that, yeah, I mean, even if Flashbots is fully committed to transparency, I really wonder about the fact that some other initiative will uh, will uh, start like against uh, the um, like the, the kind of harmful MEV extraction that will actively harm users, and that this like new initiatives will be completely opaque. And even though Flashbots itself is fully transparent. Uh, it will like um, strongly encourage uh, such uh, opaque initiatives and you know partnerships with uh, between dApps and miners so that they send the transactions privately to avoid sandwiching. I think that's very real. And one other thing I want to emphasize is that I feel like you like there is a lot of you know politics on the um, and in, that's involved on that. Uh, Flashbots is mostly like I feel like you are mostly focused on the technical aspect of it. But for example, I think that if we have not seen a lot of MEV extraction so far, it's also because of this politics thing on that miners have a reputation, that kind of stuff. Uh, on I think it's also politics that would create this second order effect. And I think it's very important to take that into account. So just just wanted to add something because I'm I'm on many calls with with mining pools uh, trying to uh, to foster the adoption of of uh, MEV gas, and what I see is that because the numbers of the, of MEV extra extraction revenue go up, a lot of pools become more um, sort of acquire this more profit seeking mindset, and especially newer entities that enter the market. So this sort of opaqueness will happen no matter uh, with or without Flashbots. And I think Flashbots is just the best answer to, to try to make it sort of as as not opaque as possible because uh, these things are happening. Min miners changing their mindset, I think. That's that's what I'm seeing. I mean, mining pools. Yeah. And then like my last thing I want to say is that um, I totally agree, and I think it's a, like it, it will like, it will go in that direction anyway. But if flashbots make it uh, much faster, um, and it also like in the short term hurt users, I feel like it doesn't really change anything in the medium or long term. But it will ha like harm users in the short term. So that's the thing I want to consider. I I think there is a possibility that like overall it's it has a negative impact. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think there's a strong possibility. Um, I think so. The, the the vision is that through three prongs, this will be avoided. One of them is transparency and like actually being committed to open source. Um, the second, and this speaks to like private forks and things like that, and also the politics that you guys mentioned. Uh, I think the politics of the community is going to be really relevant in how MEV is just uh, extracted and distributed in the short to medium term. Uh, I think in the long term, it makes like absolutely no difference. That's my hypothesis because like the incentives are very obvious and clear. So like eventually they will play out in a certain way. Uh, but in the short to medium term, how much gets extracted by who, where the profit goes, um, which miners do it, how they behave towards each other. I think these are all details that matter a lot. Um, so like my proposal there is to kind of be very vocal about MEV issues as projects and as a community. And I think another prong we can use to, to um, mitigate this is education and like teaching users how their designs are uh, insufficient. Like what does Uniswap slippage really mean? Can you expect to uh, get a certain price or like uh, what kind of execution can you expect? 
I think these education questions might actually be helped by having MEV actually actively extracted, especially if we integrate with like the, the, the visualization tools people are using. Um, so I think it easily could become opaque in the future. I hope that it becomes transparent and it actually helps users. Um, but I think there is a lot of work and like a lot of conversations like these that will need to happen. Um, and not only just happen, but ha happen in a meaningful way that like influences mining pools and the community's decisions. Um, so I think these rows are a good start, but there are, somehow we need to also think about how to expand this further. Yeah. I, I feel like that does not really address the second order effects problem because that's more about flashbots transparency. On I feel like this second order is about something else on politics. And uh, I'm a bit more pessimistic about like user education on I don't know. I feel like lots of people who won't really understand and will be pissed off on that will pressure uh, dApps on the, to to try to get their transactions mined privately. Even though I totally agree with you in, with the fact that we need more education and we actually, I mean, like in the long term, we just want to remove the, this, uh, you know, uh, these incentives and actually design dApps properly. That would be nice. But, <laughs> but right now we have a problem and we kind of have to deal with it. And I feel like it's important to try to minimize harm as well. Uh, it's like you are building a very powerful we weapon on, <laughs> uh, it has the potential to hurt people. I don't know. I feel like- Wouldn't that be a positive outcome though? Like, I feel like if we can get more dApps to like adopt, like by default, send all transactions through MEV, yes. But not like, you know, I think the point will become not to extract MEV, but to protect people from extracting MEV. If everything's going through private mempools, I think this is like a positive thing for the ecosystem. Like, I, I don't think, like, I don't think, I think this is like, I mean, you know, don't call it opaqueness, call this privacy. Like, if MEV yeah. gets just helps push us towards that faster, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's why we, we have uh, essentially laid out, um, I'm sharing my screen here, I hope you can see um, the research roadmap. And this is like literally one of the major research questions that is unclaimed. And I would love to invite all of you here um, interested in these research questions specifically to participate in our um, research workshop. Don't worry, we're not asking you to like, there's a full-time job thing. It's more that collective research process that we could uh, co-author and work on uh, something of academic rigor together. Um, that said, uh, because of um, we're running kind of, uh, you know, uh, way beyond time. So I'm going to um, um, uh, uh, continue to um, Aaron's discussion. Um, Aaron from B Protocol. Aaron, would you like to share your own screen? Yeah, yeah yes, please. OK. So this is part of our second, uh, because um, MVV Rose is not meant for Flashbots, the implementation itself. It's meant for MVV projects and communities and just di discuss the merits and debates the designs and et cetera. So that's why we're having, um, we're inviting um, ecosystem projects like B Protocol to share their insights. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So first of all, thank you for having me. And I will not be able to see text questions if there are any. So Tina, maybe if there are any questions, please uh, relay them. Um, let me share. I don't know. Try to go to full screen. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, maybe let's go over like this. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm Yaron, uh, CEO of uh, B Protocol. Uh, yeah, okay, so I was asked to share my insights about designing the system for liquidations, especially in the presence of MEV. Uh, so first of all, let's start maybe with the uh, bottom line or what is uh, my point of view uh, that actually gave rise to this project. So MEV is annoying for Uniswap arbitrage in general, 
uh, but for liquidations, it's much worse than just annoying. Uh, and in my view, eventually, you know, it could give rise to some major collapse in lending platforms uh, simply because there will not be anyone to liquidate or most <coughs> or, or, or even worse. So my point of view is that currently no big player really want to liquidate and it all goes to small players who just run you know, some arbitrage bots. Uh, so yeah, and moreover, so every dollar that goes not only to miners, but you know, one of the difficulties now that if you really want to be competitive, then it's not only about trading and hedging that you need to focus, but also on blockchain developers. Uh, I add to that that currently the market liquidation market is not that big. On the one one hand. And on the other hand, once it gets too big, it will probably be too late uh, to start hoping that, you know, big players will come. Uh, and yeah, I mean, all, all these will make DeFi platforms very unstable. Uh, some insight from traders we discussed, you know, before starting the project. Uh, so talking with, you know, so-called traditional algo traders who are now doing crypto, but maybe off chain. So when they do backstop in a centralized or traditional finance, so you know, there, there are a lot of unknowns there. Hedging is, is very complicated. Uh, you don't really know what you get because you don't know market conditions, etc. Uh, but this is something, you know, they learn to do. They, they have a lot of experience. But now if you add all the blockchain issues, Gas wars is one, gas cost in general, uh, which does not exist, traditional finance, network topology, etc. Then, you know, all of a sudden, risk estimation models become much more complex. So th this is why they don't, you know, don't tend to participate there. Uh, speaking with existing projects, so previously I was CTO of Kyber Network, the Kyber network team actively market make on chain uh, a lot, uh, does millions in volume. So, so yeah, I mean, it does uh, know how to handle the blockchain complexity, gas costs, etc. But still, they don't want to go, didn't want to go into liquidations because all of the gas was. Uh, and finally, another perspective is that <clears throat> but it's it's not only the my, the MEV uh, that uh, make the uh, required premium for liquidation higher, and in DeFi it's much higher than in centralized finance. S so it's not only about the MEV, the uncertainty or the competition element in general uh, make it less profitable or at least less unknown. And this is why DeFi platforms are forced to offer uh, bigger incentives. So this is like the overall or maybe the summary, but let me now dive in into the talk and present what we do. Uh, so first of all, about myself, uh, so CEO of B Protocol. Before B Protocol, I was working for a few months on a front running, back running bots, uh, liquidation bots. Uh, before that was city of Kyber Network. Kyber Network, especially in the sense that it was the first to actually do market making on chain. So not, not just by a fixed formula, but actually submitting uh, Ethereum transaction for every price update, having liquidity on chain, etc. Uh, was working on wrapped Bitcoin uh, before doing uh, smart contract professionally. I was doing PhD in computer science and did some academic research. One of them was uh, with uh, later the CEO of Kyber Network. We did Smart Pool, which was a decentralized smart contract mining pool, uh, and even mined a few blocks there. Uh, yeah, so I've, first of all, okay, I will briefly explain what are lending platforms and liquidation. I assume most of the audience here is already familiar with it. Uh, MEV is definitely something you know, and then we'll talk about the B protocol solution. 
So yeah, okay. Learning platforms are you know like a key element uh, or key pillar in uh, DeFi with billions uh, in locked value. B basically, you have a lender who deposit a coin. You have a so, so you, you have a deposits of coin. Uh, everyone can deposit. Everyone can borrow in return to a deposit. Uh, and once your debt is bigger than your collateral, plus some safety margin, uh, then you get liquidated. Uh, and the incentive for liquidators uh, is that they get the user collateral with a premium, and in return, they have to pay the user debt. Uh, okay, and without liquidation, so die in particular could lose the peg, compound and ave will go bankrupt. Eventually, all of DeFi is based on proper liquidation scenario process. Uh, okay, now how, how liquidations are done in traditional finance. So first of all, uh, when you set, set up or spawn a new, uh, new centralized system that, you know, but typically in traditional finance, these are exchange that allow you to trade with margin. So first of all, you, you form a backstop of big, uh, big algo traders. They commit on liquidation uh, of certain amounts, namely they lock some capital. Uh, on the other hand, the platform commits that it, you know, if liquidation were to happen, then you will get uh, a guaranteed profit, which, okay, it's not really a profit, but a liquidation discount uh, when it happens. Uh, and when liquidation is needed, okay, they either throw it to the order book, but if there are extreme market conditions, they da just dump the position on the liquidators, and then the liquidators need to get rid of the position. Uh, so liquidators here get certainty, and this center certainty allows them to prepare for such big events. Uh, and platforms like BitMEX can do hundreds of millions of liquidations uh, per day. But j j just to give, you know, maybe some comparison. So in MakerDAO, recently they introduced this parameter that basically does not allow to liquidate more than $60 million per six hours or so. Uh, and Maker is by far, you know, like the biggest uh, liquidator. Uh, consumer, liquidation consumer. Uh, so, oh, okay, so in, in the decentralized finance these days, so instead of onboarding uh, big algo traders, so you just let, let everyone participate. Uh, now you let everyone participate, so you cannot ask for any commitment from the people who participate. Uh, so platform do offer a discount, but this discount is shared with the miners, uh, with the so-called MEV. Uh, so the outcome eventually is that liquidators only liquidate if it's convenient to them. M most likely if they can immediately arbitrage it with Uniswap or other platforms. And Uniswap, liquidation, uh, Uniswap liquidity gets bigger and bigger, right? But Still, you cannot liquidate there with proper slippage, more than a few millions. So this is not something that can bring you, you know, to BitMEX level. Uh, and BitMEX already has $4 billion in liquidity, right? I mean, the scalability there is also uh, bounded. So, okay, so we discuss uh, centralized finance, decentralized finance, and finally, what is it we offer in the protocol? So in a sense, we let everyone to participate, or at least in the pa in the future. Uh, however, we let everyone participate on a time base and not a liquidation base. Namely, the competition is not for every liquidation, uh, but instead liquidators get a franchise uh, for a time period, and then they share the liquidation. Uh, as a result, the liquidators are more committed, and in the future, you know, this commitment might be in the form of actual uh, economic incentive. Uh, the, the liquidation itself is being decided by a smart contract, uh, so nothing is shared with the miners, you know, beside the standard gas fees, but there's no competition among the miners. Uh, 
Uh, and as a result, the liquidators are committed. Are committed and they do have incentive, you know, at least as the system get bigger uh, to be prepared for bigger liquidations. Uh, so liquidators compete on liquidation franchise, which in the future could be a share process. So, so right, they already willing to share uh, their proceeds with the users. Uh, in the future, there might, might be auctions uh, around that. Uh, a smart contract decides who gets to liquidate a specific user at a specific time, and users share the proceeds with the liquidator. So liquidator gets certainty, uh, but lower liquidation penalty, which most are happy with because liquidation penalty in DeFi are still relatively high. The platform get committed liquidators and user get uh, a bit more than they used to. Uh, so, so Bay Protocol is already live on top of existing uh, platforms and uh, that, like the, the core uh, value proposition of Bay Protocol is that we take an existing platform, say MakerDAO, we let user interact with MakerDAO exactly uh, the way he interacted before, only with some uh, smart contact wrapper, uh, namely the Bay Protocol. So user deposit and borrow as usual. Uh, but the liquidators <coughs> can provide a cushion to the user uh, position. Namely, they can repay part of his debt. Uh, and this way, when a user, uh, user account become insolvent according to MakerDAO metric, uh, so MakerDAO uh, external system or external liquidators uh, see it actually has a lower debt. Right, so let's say user original debt was 1,000 die, but our liquidators repaid 100 die of his debt. Uh, so now, according to MakerDAO, uh, he cannot be liquidated. So none of the MakerDAO keepers can liquidate. Uh, but according to B protocol, we know that if he were using MakerDAO directly, he would have been liquidated. And at this point, the smart contract allowed the li our liquidators to liquidate him. And every time they liquidate it, they liquidate someone, uh, they send some of the proceeds to a jar. Uh, and every once in a while, according to some user scoring method, uh, this jar is distributed among all users. Uh, okay, so B protocol is already live, already over $20 million uh, in deposits. Uh, there is or there will be a governance, but without a token. Uh, so like here, maybe an insight is that user are willing. Uh, you know, like the selling point is that users do not take any extra risk, but obviously there's the smart contract risk. Uh, so we see that at least for now, it does get some traction. It is enough to convince some users at least to try us out. Uh, yeah, and that's us. So um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think uh, uh, actually a question for uh, for Yaren. Do you think, uh, so how do you see B protocol and Flashbots uh, positioned in, uh, in w uh, to each other within the um, MBB ecosystem? Yeah, so, so I, I think it's, it's quite orthogonal because, you know, so, so to be honest, and maybe it's a bit uh, related to the discussion before, like, you know, like the ultimate goal of MEV get is maybe to make more transparent tools. But, but again, like our, our position is that it's not really about lack of transparency, but actually competition in this case, uh, make li liquidity, you know, liquidation process uh, worse. So, so it's not really about transparency, and in this in this sense, it's quite of orthogonal uh, to the MEV research group uh, efforts. Uh, so I, I don't think it's really about the miners, though. Uh, again, maybe I don't, I'm not fully understand you know your guys' agenda because you know even if it were some kind of layer two solution there, then still someone would or could have, you know, uh, profit more by reorganizing the transaction order, etc. 
so yeah, that's my view. Cool. Would like to invite questions. Anyone here have a um, question for Yaren and the design of? Could you just talk a little more about the cushion and why I guess that was helpful in the protocol? Uh, mm, yeah, OK. Let, let me share it again. So we, you know, a value proposition to users is, OK, you're using MakerDAO. Come use us and get get exactly the same conditions, you know, plus some uh, posit uh, distribution, posit sharing. So we solve the cushion. Uh, we could could not have liquidated him under the same conditions, right? I mean, because then we will have to compete with MakerDAO uh, other keepers, which you know, again we have gas walls again okay so in maker now it's been sent on auction etc but in order to get priority uh, for our liquidators uh, they have to provide a cushion because otherwise user will just get liquidated in a maker now so like an alternative solution here would be to say to user oh, okay so maybe you know we don't provide a cushion but you get liquidated before you would have normally get liquidated uh, in maker but, but then you know it's a different value proposition to the user you know we, we ask him to give up something in return and with this cushion you can use maker exactly the same way he used before get exactly the same conditions uh, and still giving us priority yeah, that makes sense um i think to answer some of your questions also, Ben, uh, uh, I think uh, you're, you're, you're right that I think this is somewhat orthogonal uh, to Flashbots. And uh, I think it's really interesting to kind of provide priority in that way uh, and use it to, to align those incentives a little better um, and improve efficiency. Um, long term, I think in terms of the, the layer two, layer one, like I personally expect there will probably always be some layer one MEV for whatever reason. There's just so many different ways uh, that it gets created and sources. Um, I expect a lot, a lot of it will move to layer twos. Uh, but like, I expect there will still be something that sticks around on, on layer one. And I think what percentage is an is a interesting open question that depends on like weird things like ETH sharding and other blockchains uh, that become popular. Um, I also think. Uh, yeah, in, in that world, like a lot of the tools and the research we're doing still applies uh, on things like like how to extract that MEV and, and the ethics and things like that. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think if it ends up that all MEV goes to L2, I think that's very unlikely that like all MEV goes to L2. And like we can't fund MEV research on L1 MEV, um, then probably that will be some sort of reevaluation, but I, I think the, the the artifacts that are being built here will still be useful in that world. Yeah, yeah. just what I wanted to uh, actually say that even if all go to L2, so still my view is that it's still a huge problem, you know, for liquidation platforms or for lending platforms, be, be, because you know li liquidators don't care if they pay to the miners, right, or pay to some you know very cool uh, research uh, group. Uh, right. I mean, uh, eventually, what matters is the certainty they get and how much it costs them. You know, or like the cut of the premium they get. So yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Uh, can I ask a question quickly? Sure. Uh, so a technical question, I guess. Um, so uh, first is. How do, exactly does that work? There is like a proxy wallet for, for the user when he is using that both his funding and your funding, so that in case that you don't liquidate on time, who is getting liquidated? This proxy wallet? Uh, yeah. And the, the, the second, I mean, on, on the same theme, I uh, just want to make sure that, yeah, in case that uh, you don't liquidate on time, what exactly? happens yeah uh, okay so first of all the easy answer yeah if, if i don't like uh, you know if the platform doesn't liquidate on time then maker dao liquidators will just liquidate it so in this sense you know the, there's no custody of funds 
user does not have much or almost anything to lose by using us. So, so yeah, I mean, we... But, uh, but the stakers uh, do lose, I guess, because they have put some more that they, they wouldn't have lost if uh, they would have done the liquidation or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the liquidity provider, if they do provide a cushion uh, and don't liquidate on time, then yeah, they, they, they tend to lose the cushion, yeah. So uh, are they in charge of uh, also monitoring and sending liquidation transactions? Or yeah, yeah, or yeah. At this point, yeah, at this point, it's their responsibility. Uh, and also at this point, it's kind of opti or not only opt in, you know, it's like a best effort system where they don't really have to liquidate if it's, you know, too hard for them because like the... At this point, uh, when bootstrapping it, you know, we, we made it uh, as easier, easiest as possible to liquidate also without any strict requirements. Along the time, as it gets more traction, you know, more revenues to the system, more liquidators we want to join, then we can ask for stricter commitment maybe. Or, but by the way, it won't be us, it will be the community who will get in charge. Uh, so yeah, and I, I answering maybe a, a question from uh, a text question. So yeah, as I forgot to say, but the platform already liquidated collateral worth of hundred thousand dollar. Actually, it wasn't in the recent days. In the recent days, uh, there were very few liquidation because most of the users joined when ETH was much lower. But like a few weeks ago, there was a market crash from I think seven hundred dollars to six hundred or so. Oh, I don't remember the exact number, and, and yeah, there were already liquidations of hundred thousand dollar of collateral back then. So yeah. Uh, okay. In, in terms of percentage of total liquidations, so again, we, we only have. You know, like 20 million collateral and in depth it's only 7 million out of over 1 billion uh, of total MakerDAO like users so obviously we didn't capture all of MakerDAO liquidations we cannot capture we can only capture our users uh, and being still a small fraction of uh, MakerDAO so we only had small fraction of the liquidations well uh, on this note actually uh, I would like to uh, direct discussion to Alex, uh, Alex from um, Flashbots team. So uh, the question here is, I don't know if you guys can see my screen. I switch back to the MEV Explorer, which currently um, tallied up uh, uh, common MEV strategies and liquidations, as we know, um, uh, as we see here, due to um, early stage of coverage, we're still working on improving coverage, accounts for a small percentage. However, one um, uh, particular uh, point we, we um, are making in our uh, MEV inspect progress uh, process is that uh, maker data liquidations, uh, we are not accounting for them for specific reasons. And so um, I think for the audience here, a lot of us um, are not quite familiar with um, MEV, um, the, the definition, the formal definition, and as well as like, uh, essentially, maybe Alex, do you want to kind of uh, share a bit of thoughts into essentially how B protocol is touching a, uh, the um, MVV, uh, so, uh, resolving the MVV problem and how uh, from our view of the space itself, like um, what constitute of M MEV, um, what, what, where is the overlap here? Um, right, so why we don't classify um, um, maker liquidations as MEV um, is because they have switched to an auction model in multi-collateral DAI, which means they're not influenced by transaction ordering like a DYDX or compound liquidation, say. So you don't have people, you know, doing back running strategies or earlier on trying to front run each other. And that's, that's yes. more... So, 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 so actually, in Maker, still in the current system, uh, so actually you, you do get some priority for being the first, namely they have this auction system and every bid should improve the former bid by at least 3%. So actually towards the end of the auction, there is a bit of a race on who is doing actually the, the last order, you know, which is typically like 3% below market price. So there's still some MEV there. 
but the, but the fact that you can't create like a full loop out of it means that like you are uh, you're constantly exposed to like an asset. You can't, you know what I mean? Like there's a big difference between I'm placing a bid for something with like a six hour time horizon and I'm gonna complete a loop right now. Yeah, no, no, but you know, like in the one minute before the auction end, then there's kind of a race on who, you know, who will bid a market price minus 3%. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, also just to emphasize, you know, so B protocol main objective is mostly to secure and make, you know, DeFi platforms uh, safer, not necessarily reduce MEV, uh, but commenting on the chart. So again, my first slide said that, you know, while MEV on lending platforms, it might be much smaller than on arbitrage platforms, Uniswap, etc. I think the danger to the DeFi ecosystem is much bigger uh, in MEV of liquidations rather than MEV of ar Uniswap arbitrage. Uh, that's my point of view. Cool. Um, any other questions? Um, I think we are essentially running very low on time. Um, our jet lag, watery eye, um, teary eye, Tom Smith, because he's asleep. So we're going to run through his questions um, because a lot of them we actually touch on. Um, and I think they're great questions that deserve much deeper thoughts and uh, deeper conversations. Um, so first, um, how? Um, so basically, in um, every problem space, there's the unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Flashbots through MEV inspect is basically quantifying um, the um, MEV uh, in the space that uh, you have. You guys have seen um, a little bit of it in the sneak preview earlier. And um, in addition, Flashbots, the core infrastructure, um, is uh, diving into experimenting and mitigating actively. However, um, in uh, Pacquiao's roast um, questions, essentially, um, we touch on the second, uh, second order effects and opacity due to private mempool's uh, rampant existence is um, somewhat considered a second order effect. I wanna uh, quickly ask rapid fire, anyone to think of other second order effect uh, or if you're a galaxy brain thir third order effects that we may not be anticipating. Anyone? Um, I think, so let me throw out a few for food for thought. Uh, regulatory, legal, uh, public perception effects uh, in the way people perceive DeFi versus traditional finance, uh, political ammo for incumbent financial institutions, uh, mining regulations uh, generally around censorship. Cool. Anyone else say random words? I think it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, this is pure brainstorming because I think most of the time we're very focused on solving uh, the problems right at hand and we can't really untangle the problems itself. So perhaps think about it from secondary or tertiary effect, order effect could help in thinking some of the longer term impact while we're acting. Anyone here? Surya? Surya is uh, one of our MEV fellow who's design, uh, working on auction mechanism research. but who's muted. So if there's um, no one here who can think of um, any other um, second order effect, I would like to direct that question to um, being discussed async in our Discord channel, um, the research uh, channel in Discord. Well, the second question, which we also touched on, is 
in the future world, Phil, as you mentioned, majority of uh, economic activity on Ethereum moved to L2 with built-in sequencing. Then what is the role of the generalized L1 MEV tools that we will see emerging on top of um, Flashbot's ecosystem? Hello. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't have a really good answer for this, but as Phil mentioned kind of briefly early on, it will still be L1 activity, right? Even when you have L2, you, you still use L1 as your trust layer. Uh, and, you know, there's some interactions between layer one and layer two, and there's actually new vectors of attacks as well, and MEV attacks between layer one and layer two related to, you know, submitting a, a fraud proof on layer one and miners censoring that and that type of stuff. Um, so I think MEV will definitely probably change its shape. Um, and it might look very differently in the sense where it won't be individual transactions and uh, on layer two, you know, the, the, the transactions on layer two will be submitted on layer one as like a batch of transactions and that type of stuff. So one, there'll be new interactions. Two, um, I do think a lot of the approach and work we're doing applies to generally a lot of different systems, including layer two systems. There's still a notion of transaction ordering within uh, a lot of layer twos. And so a lot of the research and work we're doing would, you know, would have to be adapted, but does does apply to some extent to that. Um, so again, not a very good answer, but uh, it's an active area of research. And also as it's not entirely clear what is going to happen in this layer two war. I mean, I don't want to call it a war, but in, it just, you know, how, how things are going to shape up. That's going to dictate a lot of how we can adapt the the tools we're building and that the community will build to layer twos. I do know from firsthand conversations with some of the projects building layer twos that MEV is a concern or generally the, you know, uh, meddling around transaction ordering. Uh, this, the problem is just somewhat shifted from, from miners in layer one to, you know, roll up providers, for example. Um, I don't know if anyone has additional comments or rebuttals. I think what I would say is if you draw a box around every L2 that people actually use, that's basically the same as an L1. And like, there's still going to be cross-protocol cross, cross protocol opportunities that need to be understood. There's still going to be things that need to be quantified for users in MEV Explorer. There's still going to need to be an auction mechanism. Uh, I expect there will be a lot of different projects and protocol tokens. Um, I think there's already a few that operate on L2 uh, and also maybe handle MEV on L2. But uh, I think the the open source software technically is not not very different. Uh, I'd be curious if anyone has thoughts on the economics uh, or anything like that. Well, um, once again, um, let's move on to the next question and um, would keep this, this uh, questions discussion in Discord. And so should protocols and their users have the right to protocol specific MEV? Should a portion of MEV go back to users or the DAO? If so, how might such a mechanism work in attributing the value back to part of the ecosystem um, stakeholders. This is a question uh, very, I think, specific and quite often uh, brought up. I would expect most of us here would be able to um, have some thoughts into, into it. I think we just saw a presentation about exactly a protocol for this, right? So. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the question here is like, how, much, how large is the design space here, I guess? Uh, or what, is, what this in, implies, I think B protocol showcase one um, example implementation, design implementation. Can, is there any potentially general, generalizable approach to this?
Any takers? So, so, so I, I think, uh, although, you know, it's not really clear, but Kipper Dow claimed to have some approach, you know, like, I think the generalization of it is, okay, let us, you know, order your transaction, but also let us take some of the MEV, you know, this transaction entails. For, for example, let us time your Uniswap trade and, you know, we will front run you, but someone will front you anyway, so might as well let us do it and then, you know, let us share the profits. Uh, still, personally, I think, you know, there are a lot of issues with that, but I think it, it it is an approach that Keeper Dow may be trying to push, not really clear. Yeah, I think the design space is, is pretty large from my perspective. Uh, I don't know, I haven't thought about it that much, but uh, it seems like from the design we've seen and uh, the designs people are trying, there are definitely a lot of different possible ways to do this. Um, I wonder, like, basically what we see both on MEV Explorer and in general is that, like, once you have an interesting mechanism like MakerDAO, you basically get a bunch of spin-offs that use the same core incentive scheme and the same mechanisms to accomplish different uh, goals. Uh, so I wonder if these can almost be, like, standardized for classes of MEV and if that can inform how we, uh, how we categorize in our research taxonomy. Um, that could be interesting to think about. Cool. Noted for our research. Next up. Um, lastly, um, this is more of a meta question. I think essentially MEV resembles climate change in the sense of existential threat. Uh, that's a collective action problem, but negative effects are too difficult to feel on any individual or local level. So what's the most important thing we need to do to get people to care? How do how do we find more people like Palkio, like Lev, who um, vocally um, uh, write down their thoughts and, and, and voice their opinions on, on things? And how do we be able to get people to care? I guess that's I think that's something that's also flashbots want to bring to the table as well. We want to let address, point out the problems, um, dissect them so that is digestible and be able to help the space in um, understanding the second order and tertiary effect. Uh, and so I guess we want to open up to everyone here. I guess the fact that you are here on this call means that you care. So perhaps if um, we haven't, you, you haven't got a chance to introduce who you are, um, maybe ask, um, share a bit about what you care about in this space and who you are. And thanks for staying for the last bit. I think we're just, um, we would like to hear from some of you if you uh, would like to share. I definitely see a few people I follow on Twitter, but I've never spoken person and I'm very curious uh, why you're here. If you're listening, um, I'm going to ask Jun Yu from my C3, right? <laughs> well, maybe it looks like quite a few folks are on mute. Or um, anyone else, uh, Olivier um, from from representing the mining min, minor perspective, if you would like to speak about what you care about MEV. You know, maybe it's because I am, uh, this is near the end of the uh, presentation. Also my pronunciation of everyone's name is probably just completely off. So, um, well, if there's no one who would like to share why they care we assume that you don't care enough so um yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so I, I have something to say you know that is not related really to liquidations uh, maybe you know like from a trader perspective although i'm not really considering myself a trader 
like in the real world, algo traders will definitely will usually try to you know pick up some arena when they have when they have some unfair advantage. For example, fast connectivity to markets, etc. Uh, or translate it, it, you know, into DeFi. So if me as a, you know, like potential DeFi trader know that some other people might have some direct connectivity to miners, you know, have some optimized tool which are not available to me, then, you know, eventually it will make me not participate in this space and, you know, try to find some more fair playground. So I think in this sense, MEV, you know, uh, the real issue is maybe not the user who gets front run in a Uniswap, but actually a lot of traders who don't join the space and as a result, maybe less liquidity or others, other stuff because they feel, you know, other traders have some unfair advantage where unfair sometimes just a lot of, you know, they have a lot of blockchain knowledge uh, or maybe unfair because they have like direct connection with miners. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Uh, I think Budish, Budish, Crampton, and Shim wrote like a bunch of papers on F HFT, really one core paper, which I've always thought was super interesting in this way, where they like basically say that like a lot of uh, arbitrage behavior uh, disincentivizes liquidity provision and maybe increases volume, but uh, actually decreases liquidity. So those two things aren't uh, necessarily correlated like across market designs. Um, and uh, you know, has a lot of interesting, uh, I guess, hypotheses about uh, how to change fairness. But I think the question of MEV and fairness is uh, super intricately linked. And uh, that's actually why I care about it. Like, I think we should build things that are fair for users. And MEV has a huge potential to turn all of the things that we are building with the best intentions into something that's not actually fair um, and therefore isn't actually efficient or desirable. Um, and I, I, I think I want more people to speak if they're around, but if you don't, that's fine. Thanks for staying. I know we're over time. Uh, and maybe, you know, if you want to tweet something about why you care about MEV in the next week, we can turn this into like more of a homework style thing. But I would also love to hear if anyone else wants to, to say anything. I guess, uh, hi everybody. Um, my name is Robin. I am quite new to the MEV space, so was still pretty quiet and just listening. Um, I guess one perspective that might be interesting to think about is how much actually, let's say, retail or non-professional users actually have to care, right? Uh, at least on a casual level at the start. Um, because even if you get, even if there's a front running bot on Uniswap, like you set your slippage, right? So if you set your slippage too high, you risk a front running transaction, right? And if you don't want that to happen, you set your slippage lower, right? So I think there are some some elements of control to how far you can be impacted yourself. And even if you get liquidated, you don't necessarily care who liquidates you, right? So I think that's uh, that that's on the mind of a lot of people out there right now that probably have never dealt with the topic in general or maybe need some general education in terms of mining and transaction ordering and how everything of that works because I guess only still the minority of people that are involved in crypto have proper knowledge about it. Um, and then obviously crypto and everything is a lot driven by monetary incentives, right? And a lot of people still don't see big monetary opportunity there necessarily, which obviously isn't true. Um, so I guess a lot of people still don't have proper understanding about that. So I would say it's maybe just an educational question as well. Um, I will say, thank, thank you, Robin. I will say one thing that I think you can also add to, I mean, user concern could also be around flash loans and flash loan enabled hacks, right? Uh, because that is somewhat, somewhat MEV that affects users directly um, in a way that is meaningful to them. Um, and so that, that could be one way to attract the user's attention related to you know, being more careful about MEV. In that case, it, it's it's more about changing the the standards, right? In terms of like the the control that you mentioned. So having a slippage limit is is some somewhat of an MEV control. Uh, I, I definitely think there should be more of such such tools and generally more thinking around uh, the different like surfaces of of quote unquote MEV extraction uh, in these protocols. Um, yeah, just adding that. 
Yeah, I think that was a super awesome point. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I think definitely when we look at the MEV taxonomy, we should make a note to kind of categorize because there's many different kinds of MEV and it's like a kind of catch-all mathematically speaking, but in terms of what it actually means for users, uh, you're right that like a Uniswap trade being slightly out of the slippage limits is very different from like, I had this stable coin that someone paid me for a hot dog and it collapsed because of like this weird like second order liquidations thing that's like uh, totally foreign to me and I have no idea what a liquidation even is. So I think it, it is relevant in very subtle ways and like thinking from the user perspective is definitely something we need to work on more. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's also a monetary or um, even like investment narrative that still I didn't hear a lot yet, but might be interesting. Which is that uh, we've seen we've seen upticks in the usage of things like Archer DAO as well, right? Uh, seen Keeper, for example, use it for some transactions, and obviously people are wondering what is going on, right? And even from from an investment perspective, like. Obviously, people are interested in Nitro because they have a token and it can pump and they can make money. But the the relevance of hash rate will be quite important in the future, so right. So that might be an interesting topic there. So and basically, if if MEV starts being more uh, important, there's uh, there might be some direct value adds to people who actually have a certain control of hash rate. So that might be also an investor narrative that could actually catch up, which I haven't seen out there a lot yet. Which then might yeah, bring I see the intersection of tokens and MEV is like one of those unknown unknowns that Tom was asking about that maybe we should actually write down. Uh, I think that could easily could easily yield very interesting results. So yeah, I totally I totally agree that like uh, we need to improve a lot of things about how we how we like understand these things even ourselves and how we communicate them. Yeah, I think everyone here on this call is participating in defining the space itself and in furthering our own understanding and so that we could better uh, inform the general, uh, the community at large. Well, I think we're 10 minutes over time. So thank you guys so much for joining. I would like to, um, actually I do think Twitter discussions of these uh, Rose questions are a better uh, outlet um, to, to get more people who may be interested to care. So um, I would um, suggest we, uh, you tweet out your thoughts on some of these research, um, sorry, uh, Rose questions um, and your opinions if you are, um, you didn't get a chance to speak here or you would like to um, share in other form. Thank you. Yeah, I might take these and start doing like a MEV question of the day. Oh. Like all the backlogs we generate, that like just tweeting it out every day. I think that might be fun, or something like that. I don't know. Maybe we should do that as an as an organization. I don't know. We can we can talk about it, but yeah, yeah. I think some more discussion would be good uh, in like a more async way. And yes. thank you guys all for being here and staying over time. Yep. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, guys, for joining.